So what's the motivation for me? So the motivation yeah. for me is um, to network, to yeah, yeah, sure, connect yeah. with people, to market with people, not at people. Yeah. So if I can talk to you about something that you're trying to get out to market or you yeah. want to just share your experiences, the people that watch this, people that listen to this, yeah. will maybe get some nuggets of uh, value on your journey, my journey. Yeah. Your audience will be interested to listen to you, but I'll get introduced to your audience. Yeah, yeah, sure. People that know you yeah. and vice yeah. versa. Yeah, yeah. So it just, it kind of just helps both of us yeah, yeah. to get more reach. You know, people always say after a networking event or something, you always meet up and have a one to one. Yeah. We do this anyway. Yeah. yeah but yeah. all we're doing is it's just recording what we're just sharing. recording it and sharing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and there are people that are interested to learn and they're just too busy to sometimes get out of the office. So you can leave it on a podcast or on YouTube yeah. or somewhere, just leave it in the background and the conversation can just help. Yeah. So um so my my only my my core motivation to do this is yeah. to um for for the right reasons for myself yeah. and for um, uh, anyone who joins us here is to help increase their digital presence to yeah. get their voice out. Yeah. And some people don't have a budget. They don't have, uh, or, or they see this happening a lot because they, they see YouTube or LinkedIn and a lot of these things, but they've just never got yeah. into do it or done it. How do I even start? Yeah. What does yeah. it look like? And I'm just saying, just, just come in and let's have mm. a chat and let's just do it. And... <laughs> My goal ultimately is, you know, ramp up your volume. That's what yep. we call this. And and because our space is B2B and yeah. your space is B2B, um, th there's some synergies already. There's yeah, overlaps sure, and yeah. everything. And, and you know, a lot of people talk about this conflict of interest. What if another company? Yeah, well, absolutely. But even if another video guy came here, another yeah. video production came here, that would be no issue because there's enough business for all of us. I've, I, we uh, The market I was in, there was... We had three or four big competitors and about a dozen small competitors. And I always used to say, you don't have to be a shit to each other. There's way more than enough to go around. Of course. There's a, you, know, there's, you know, if somebody said to you, right, can you do video 24-7 for the next year? You know, there's still more for somebody else to go around. Absolutely. You, know? you can't so, service the whole market. Yeah, the market's yeah. too big. Absolutely. So I, th I think a lot of people have a bit of a either a tunnel vision or a glass ceiling yeah. or, or their focus is on the wrong can't, yeah can't yeah. compete I, one, one of the things I'm, one of the things i'm just just finishing now i mean i'm doing it for seo reasons but it should come across as the right reasons as well is i'm doing a directory of leads business coaches okay and i'm putting another website on my website okay very good so on one level it works from an seo point of view yeah keywords and all that sort of thing but on another level well if you're not going to use me here's yeah. I think there's 35 on the list. There's 35 other people you can look at. Yeah, yeah. you're being helpful. Me. You're being helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. It builds trust, credibility. And then you would think people go, oh, well, if he's happy doing that, well, maybe I'll speak to him. It, you know, is, and if they don't, if they don't, say bloody what? So Ooh. so, so there's two schools of thought that I, I really believe in is, A, you don't know what you don't know. Yep. Yep. And secondly, a conversation is harmless. All right, you might, have, you might lose 30 minutes of your time that you'll never get back again, which I get. Yep. But still, it's only 30 minutes in the yeah. grand scheme of things. We waste so much other time doing other rubbish. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> really. And I, I do this. I do, my wife says, oh, where are you going today? I'm so I'm meeting so and so for coffee. Why are you meeting for coffee? I'm just meeting for a coffee. Co it's a coffee for no reason. <laughs> Who knows what might come up with? You don't might know. come out of it. Yeah, exactly. Fine. Gives me anything else for having it. Yeah. <laughs> and you've had a coffee. And I've had a coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, coffee or tea? Which which one? Always coffee? Don't drink, don't drink tea. No, what about cha? Mm, tried it a couple of times. Mm. Yeah, does it float your boat? It's, it's it's better than tea, okay, because it's sweeter. Okay, okay. But apart from that, no, I've just not. I've just never been never ne been a tea person. Never been a tea person. Nope. What, what what kind of coffee out of curiosity? Uh, Nescafe Alta Rica. Okay. It's quite strong, but it's okay. nice. Okay. And then we've got a you know, like everybody else, we've got an espresso machine. Yeah, and. You know, a range of different coloured pods. I've got no idea which one each one is. I'll have a purple one. Let's just try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try it. Yeah. Don't don't like it. Don't do that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. remember what colour I like and what colour I don't. Okay, awesome. Good, good. I'm just going to check that. That's still turning over. Yeah. I hate to get putting it in, and it's not recording. That is looking good. Okay. And I can see my camera's running. Is that's fantastic. <laughs> so Phil. For, for a bit of background, for a bit of context, yeah. tell me about the business that you were in. Okay. 
where uh, which I believe was maybe the bulk of your career, and definitely that's what what you've sold. Yeah, and and brings you to where you are today. Just a bit of context, and then let, let's think about next steps. Okay, so um, I've done ten years in employment. Okay, um, ended up at William Hill. I launched their first ever online casino. Uh, when I was there, we came across the concept of online bingo. Um, I was asked to do a presentation to the board about the potential of getting into that market. Um, the board decided no, that's fair enough. Um, and I left William Hill at the end of that year and then went out and started consulting as an iGaming consultant. Um, and then somebody came to me and said, yeah, I want to get into iGaming. This is, you know, it's quite exciting. It's a new market. And I said, you want to get into online bingo? That's going to be the next big thing. And about 48 hours later, I thought, hang on a minute. I'm advising somebody else to get to online bingo. Why don't I do that? So I sort of dusted down this presentation I'd done to William Hill, changed it around a bit and, and turned it into an investment pitch. So I took it out to the market, angel investment style, you know, sort of like Dragon's mm -hmm. Den in real life. Yeah, yeah. Um, to try and get funding for what would have been the UK's first ever pay-to-play online bingo site. Wow. Because it was only in the US at the time. I got no interest whatsoever for various various macro reasons. Um, but what happened was I'd built a very basic website that listed all the US bingo sites who are out there. And on it, I'd put um, a very simple pop-up questionnaire, sort of age, demographic spend, frequency, recency, that sort of thing. So I, when I was doing my pitch, I sounded like I knew what I was talking about, so I knew the audience. And what happened was a number of the US bingo sites that were on my website contacted me and said, could we advertise on your website? So I said, well, and, and, and my previous sort of employed life, a lot of it was selling advertising space in print, and I'd worked in ad agencies as well. So I said, yeah, send me some money and we'll run some ads. And that became the business. So the business started completely by accident. Um, it was myself and wife initially, then freelancers. It took us five years to take on staff. Um, in year six, the US market became illegal overnight. So we lost 80% of our business. Um, we By that point, we'd started building a UK website. So the, the market decamped from the US, US to the UK, UK, and we were sort of ready and waiting. So the business stepped up again, um, went through all the usual peaks and troughs of, of business, um, you know, finding new clients, developing new products, issues with staff, you know, all the usual things, that, all the, the things that keep business owners awake at night went through that. And then in 2018, so it's actually five years ago this week, so it's actually this week, yeah. uh, we sold the business to a PLC. Awesome. So I've run the whole business journey. Operation. Yeah, I've done startup, scale, growth, exit. I've even done the... the the attempted funding, mm. which never happened. Um, Can I just ask you a question? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. So, so the the funding part of it. Yeah, you went there to fund as angel investors, yeah. and for one reason or another, they yeah. didn't buy into it. Yeah. What was your thoughts behind it? Why do you think they didn't? You know, just were, the, yeah. I mean, looking looking back at it, um, I think probably I was a bit. I mean, I've, I've still got a copy of the business plan, and it's a bit naive. Okay. Putting that aside, there were three macro reasons why we. I think we didn't get the funding. Number one, um, it was just around the time the dot-com bubble was bursting the okay. first time. So we're going out there saying, fund this dot-com business. And they were going, well, everything's collapsing around us, you know. Mm. So that didn't help. Um, the second thing was, legally, it was a grey area. Um, so it wasn't illegal, yeah, yeah. but it wasn't legal. Mm. So people think, oh, not sure about this. It, mm. it could have gone either way. And obviously in the US, it... it, it, it you went forward, but it, it, went, it, it went illegal. Yeah, yeah, it went yeah, illegal yeah. for very, in, a, in a, a sort of convoluted way. And then the third thing was, um, you know, at the time there were there were two big land based bingo players, Mecca and Gala. Mm, yeah, okay. um, they had you know, eighty percent, ninety percent of the, the land based market. Yeah. So the obvious question was, well, if this is going to be so brilliant, why aren't Mecca and Gala doing it? Mm. And the answer to that is, as with any huge big company that owns an industry, they don't see what's going on at the ground yeah. until much, much, much later on. Of course. So at the time, I think they were just starting to inquire about it, but it was another 
four or five years before they launched. So I and, and you know, not claiming to be a brilliant futurist or something, I was actually too early. Yeah, well, so, that's so, what I was alluding to. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we were we were we were too early into the market. Mm. Plus, you had those macro um, issues. Um, so yeah, so that's that's why it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. No, that th- that was my gut feeling was that. Did it? Were you ahead of the time? Yeah. And did the investors? They couldn't see what you could see. Yeah. And and investors just want a safe bet. They don't want to take a risk. Yeah. yeah. A risk is a liability, and they just and that's what felt like. Well, because especially when you when you said that it was in the US but not in the UK. Yeah. I always find not always, but with a lot of things that develop in the US, we're about five years behind. Yeah. And then we follow suit. Yeah. But it takes that time. Huge culture difference between the US and and, and us over here. Yeah. <laughs> and even when we do catch up, it's still a different animal on this side. Just mm-hmm. just because yeah we yeah we're different. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. So, um, 2018, you sold yeah, yeah, it to yeah, PLC. Yeah. Um, which brand? Can you share that? Or uh, yeah, we sold it to um, a company called XL Media. So, oh, right. at, okay. at the time, in the market, I mean, the the beauty about the online market is really easy to knock up a website, and yeah. you're immediately a competitor. Of course. So there were loads and loads of what we because we were in the affiliate market. Sure. There were loads and loads of what people call bedroom affiliates. You know, one man bands doing it for himself, yeah. and some of those were successful, and they yeah. grew and grew and grew, and some didn't. But it, uh, in the market, there were a number of uh, acquisitors, there were a number of people buying up these smaller companies, um, and Excel Media just happened to be one of them. It was quite a small industry, so I knew most of them, and I spoke mm-hmm. to a few of them, sure. Um, and it just happened they were the ones with the the best deal and the best. And I, I talk about this a lot now when people are talking about selling their businesses. Not only was it necessarily the best figure. It was the best structure as well. And this okay. is important. This is important for anybody who's watching. If they're thinking of selling their business, it's how you structure, how you get your money from the buyer. You know, it's not, here's the keys, here's a bag of cash. Goodbye, see you later. Um, we, the transition. Is hand, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's hand over, hand over you know, and a, a lot of businesses will be sold on maybe a three-year deal. Mm. So it's, you know, here's a certain amount on day one. Here are some stage payments over maybe a three-year period. Now, it might be that those stage payments are um, based on figures. Mm. So you have to stay in the business and you have to deliver Carry this, on. this, and this. Absolutely. Um, or it might just be you'll get it, but you'll get it over a time. And it's not on, you know, it's not necessarily on performance. performance it's just right. it's just Still cash flow yeah, basis. Yeah. Um, it might be you have to stay in the business. It might be you have to walk away from the business. Mm. There's lots and lots of parameters mm. as how a deal is structured. And sometimes you might be better taking a bit less yes, if you get your money earlier, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So the structure of the deal was very good as well from, from our point of view. Yeah, fantastic. So going how much? That's what, you know, that's what everybody wants to know. What <laughs> how much um, money do you make? Let's say um, I don't need to work anymore. Okay, fantastic. So enough to keep me comfortable. Fantastic, good. Well, I'm, I'm really happy for you. Yeah. Because that's what, every, you know, everyone goes into business, they've got the entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, yeah. But they want... So some people want exit. Some people don't want exit. Some people don't know. But I think the 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 motivation for even being that entrepreneurial, going on the entrepreneurial journey, yeah. is to be kind of um, financially free. Give you that financial freedom. Yeah. I think that's what, what whether people know it or don't know it. Yeah, I think that's part of that journey. It's part of it. It's part of it. I mean, I was. It's interesting. Um, you know, I, I now read a lot about M and A and exits and things like mm-hmm. that, and you know. You know, a lot of businesses, the, the the owner of the business has just created a job for themselves. Yeah, yeah. They are they are the business. They, they're self employed. They're self in effect. All right, so it might be a limited company, but they're the business, of course. Um, or they've got to the point where they haven't taken any money out of the business over mm. 20, 30, 40 years, and this is this is their pension pot. This is their mm. hail mary. This is their one and only chance. Mm. And what a lot of business owners don't do and should be doing is almost, even if you're not selling, is working out how to create a product or a business that runs without you as the business owner. Absolutely. Because then you have something to sell. And, and somebody said this to me recently, and I, I love it, is you should take you should take the two-week holiday test. So can you go on holiday for two weeks, <laughs> turn your phone off, turn your laptop off, and does the business still run? Yeah. If it does, then you've got something sellable. If you're sat by the pool on your phone, all day, every day, 
or you know, yeah. um, and you know, take something like a plumber. Let's say you're a self-employed plumber. If you go on holiday, you know, work gets done. Yeah, exactly. There's nothing wrong with being a plumber. Yeah. I'm just saying. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's yeah. important. Um, and I think you know, you know, I think entrepreneurial people love the challenge and love the the chase and love the the fight and and you know, all that sort of stuff. And with me, it was very much. Um, it was like that. It was like, you know, I just want to be successful. Not financially. And I think it was more, I want my business to be number one. And if you do that, then the, the financial stuff sorts itself it'll out. It'll just come. Yeah, it'll come. It's going to come anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we were in the, we were in the situation, like I say, it was myself and my wife. I didn't have a job at the time. Um, you know, the first aim of the business was to put food on the table mm-hmm. and pay the bills, and pay, you know, pay the mortgage. And then you go... Step bit, by step. It's yeah. like Maslow's hierarchy, you know. All right, well, we've paid, we can pay the mortgage, we can pay, you know, we can clothe the kids, we can pay, <laughs> we can put food on the table. Should we go on holiday? Yeah. Shall we buy a new car? Yeah, yeah. because it keeps growing. Shall we, shall we? And and if your business is successful, so when you come to sell at the end, it's not a Hail Mary. Mm. You know, you've you've accrued wealth over that journey because mm. you've paid yourself. You know, it doesn't have to be stupid, but you've paid yourself the market rate. And if you've done that and the business is successful and there's still money in the the business, then that Hail Mary at the end isn't there. It's just, okay, I have now built up my bank of wealth, whatever that might be. And this is Mm. bunts. This is the extra stuff, Mm. not this is, oh, shit, I need this as my pension pot. Mm. I I agree. And I think it's a great, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a great thing to share because I think there's two types of entrepreneurs. I think. I think they fall into two buckets. And one bucket is like commercially minded people that go into a business being purely commercial. And there's another type of, type of entrepreneur that is passionate about what they do. Yeah. Like the plumber that you described. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of businesses that are more like that, that are trade oriented, whether it's making videos, whether it's coaching, whether it's plumbing. Yeah. Because for one reason or, or another, they don't like their employer, they uh, can't find an employer, or they just want to work for themselves, which sure. is perfectly fine as well. And they just work, work, work. And, and then as their success grows, that lifestyle business turns into a business and they employ more people and their reputation. And <coughs> my, my observation of it is that for a lot of business owners or them entrepreneurs, their lifestyle is the business. Yeah. Whereas the lifestyle should feed the business. So exactly what you're saying, that, that that business should feed your lifestyle. Yeah. And they should actually be two separate entities because like you said, and I think that's a great way to do that uh, health check or, you know, two week holiday break. I think that's great. That is that. Can you go away for two weeks and, um, you know, will the business still keep going without you, mm-hmm. without you being on the phone yeah. and giving support? But the the other side of it as well, and, 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 and often people sort of fall into this trap of I've got to get bigger, I've got to get bigger, I've got to get bigger. Mm-hmm. Lifestyle businesses are absolutely fine. Yeah. If you've got a lifestyle business and it fits with how you want your life to run, yeah. fine. Happy. You don't have to. I mean, I've got I've got a number of friends who've got who are sort of one two man bands. Mm-hmm. They don't want any more. Mm-hmm. I'm very happy doing this. I don't want to, I don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, every employer will say the biggest headache is staff. <laughs> yeah. You know, we love them all to bits, but yeah. they. They become a headache. They're the biggest liability in the in a business. Yeah. So so having a lifestyle business isn't a negative. Mm-mm. If that's right for you, fine. Leave it as a lifestyle business. Absolutely fine. No problem whatsoever. Agreed. Agreed. I think I think people get um, hooked on numbers sometimes. Oh, I've got to get to this figure. I've got to get this kind of yeah. turnover. And I think that's just vanity. <laughs> and, and, think, it, and it's comparing yourself to other people as well. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. The guy down the road who's doing the same as me. Yeah. You know, his figures are this, his office is bigger, his car's bigger, he's <laughs> bragging on LinkedIn about it. Yeah, Actually, he, he's probably got a distress level up here. Absolutely. And you're much smaller and quite happy. Yeah. But you, you start, you get compar- comparisonitis. Of course. And you're, oh, I've got to do that because he's doing that. I've got to do that because yeah. they're doing that. She's doing that. She's doing that. Someone told me many years ago, um, a friend of mine down in London is a solicitor, Um legal compliance so and he goes as you grow 
don't forget your problems grow as well. Yeah. So so don't just look at the the the, the revenue and the money you make and yeah. all of that because all of this rubbish that you comes don't, with it that comes with it. And yeah. if, if this is going to multiply, that's going to multiply. Yeah. And um, people don't think about that, they, yeah. or they don't see it, or they only realize that when it's when they get in there. the thick of it exactly. So okay, so that was. 2018. Yep. So we sold 2018. Five years later. Yep. What are you doing now? How are you helping businesses, or are you just living the life? So I'm I'm now working as what I call a business sounding board. Okay. Sort of halfway between a business coach and a business mentor. Okay. And all business owners will recognise this, and and it's, you know it's a common phrase. It's lonely at the top. You know, it's great. We've just been saying it's great running your own business. You can do what you want. You can strategically take it where you want. You can grow. You can stay lifestyle. You can do whatever you want. But often there's nobody there to bounce ideas off. There's nobody there to sense check things. There's nobody there to help you when you get stuck. Uh, there's often nobody there as an accountability partner. Um, you know, I felt this, and I'm sure you felt this as you grow. It just feels like you're making it up as you go along. And I felt like that a lot of the time. Okay, yeah. And, you know, you need somebody to say, is, it, is this the right thing to do? Yeah. Or I'm going to think of it, is this, is this like really stupid? Mm -hmm. So I allow business owners to, and I think this is important, A, confidentially, and B, without me having a dog in the race, so no bias whatsoever, mm -hmm. to be able to sit down with me and discuss their opportunities, their problems, their issues, their frustrations, and help them so i'm not giving them answers i'm helping them work it out themselves find their own answers find their own answers and most people most people and i've had this many a time that people will sit and talk to me for half an hour an hour wherever it might be i might ask two or three questions and they'll finish and go, oh my god phil that's absolutely brilliant yeah. and i'll say i didn't say anything you said it all of course i you know i because i've been because i've been through the same journey and it's irrelevant what business sector you're in. I've been through the same journey of startup, scale, growth, all the sleepless nights at the weekends, all that sort of thing. So I can empathize, but I can also say, well, something similar happened to me and, and we considered A, B, and C. You know, what does that look like in your business and your sector? Have you considered this? Have you mm. considered that? Have you considered this? And the client will go, oh, actually, I could I could do that, or I could do that, or this might be an answer. Um, and they go away with a cl much, much, and a, a lot of it's down to clarity. Mm. And they go away with a much clearer idea, uh, usually of of where they want to get to and, more importantly, how they get there. And a lot of that, I one of my all-time favorite business books is Seven Habits by Stephen Covey. One of the key habits of that is start with the, be start with the, end, start oh, with the end in mind. mind. So I'll off, I, I use this question a lot with a lot of clients is, what does perfect look like in a year? Great question. Okay. And people go, well, I was, yeah, I just want to be bigger. All right, well, yeah. how much bigger? <laughs> yeah, quantify it. All right, I want a million pounds of sales, or I want to launch five new products. Yeah. Or, as we said, I want to sell the business, mm -hmm. or I want to buy the competitor down the road. Now, each of those mm -hmm. – we'll need a different strategy to be set. Of course. And what we do is we just work backwards it's from there. Right. So if you want a million pounds worth of sales, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to need some more products and I'm going to need a sales director. Or I'm going to need a bigger sales team, mm. bigger customer service. Well, okay, how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to have to recruit somebody. Well, okay. Do you know what the job spec looks like? No, I haven't written a job spec yet. Well, you know, mm. and, and it cascades backwards. And I use, I use something, um, I use a five-step process, which I call the phrase of five-step so that I can say FFS and people, <laughs> and people, I can write, it's much, it's much, it's a much better joke written than the verb. Um, and it works backwards so to, from what you're trying to do all the way yeah. down to minutia. And then you flip it upside down, you start at the minutia. And you, and start you go with forward. Back up, yeah. So a lot of clients will go away going, right, okay, I now have a plan. Now what will normally happen with that plan mm. is other things fall out of it. Yeah. So they'll come back. You know, next week, next month, and go right, Phil. I've now got an issue. I can't find five salespeople because I want to increase my sales. Yeah, you know, whatever it might yeah, be. So something yeah. will drop out of it. But the other side of it, as I say, it, one of the important parts of it is there's no judgment, there's no bias, yeah, sure. confidential. So as a business owner, you can't sit in your team meeting with your team and go, guys, mm. 
I actually don't know where we're going now, but you <laughs> tell me. I'm a bit stuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, doesn't but, sit well, does it? <laughs> it doesn't sit well. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, the the people people often go for advice. So that might be your lawyer, your accountant, uh, your friend who's also got a business, mm-hmm. your husband or your wife or your partner. All of them, either consciously or more likely subconsciously, will have a bias. Of course. Right? I'll give you a very extreme example. Um, I had a client who's a couple of ladies who've got very successful businesses themselves. They come together to create a third business, um, did a bit of work with them. Uh, they sort of went away, put website together, put the product together, put the package together, did some marketing and got zip, got nothing. And I was the one who had to say to them, as the phrase goes, your baby's ugly. I was the one who had to say, do you know what? Can it? You make more. You make much more money running your own businesses anyway. Mm. But their husbands wouldn't say that. Wow. You know, their lawyer or their web developer or the people they're putting the product together with wouldn't say that. Not necessarily because they didn't know it's right, but subconsciously or consciously they would be. I don't really want to tell you. It's a stupid idea. Mm. So, so there's that side of things. So there's the 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 lack of bias helps. Yeah. But then the other thing I think is important, and this comes out a lot, is an accountability partner. Mm, so okay. you'll know as a business owner, yeah. um, there are there are things you should be doing. Are you looking guilty already? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are things you should be doing yeah. that you're putting off, or you. Yeah. But you, I always compare it to a cold piece of broccoli on your plate. You should eat it. You know you should eat it. You know it's good for you, but you don't want to do it. So we'll have meetings. I'll say, Rash Pal, did you, you said you were going to yeah. do X, Y, Z last week. Did, did you, you do it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I did. Fantastic. Good. Um, and, and that helps as well. Um, but it, a lot of it is generally just that looking from the outside in. Yeah. You can't see. And I, and I had it. And one of the reasons I think there's value in what I do is I had it on a number of occasions where where external people came into my business mm. and gave us advice on things I couldn't see. Yeah. You're too close to it. You, you just too, can't see yeah, it. Absolutely too close. And, and yeah. one of the things, and, and this is something I recommend to all clients, is a, a guy came in and did, did a, a, like a staff 360. Mm. So he sat down with each individual member of staff, said, okay, mm. what do you like about the business? What don't mm. you like about the business? What should we be doing more of what should we stop doing mm. it's like a, almost like a SWOT, a SWOT analysis mm. and then he reported all that back to me now what, what he didn't say is well you know she said this and he said that yeah you know, it was themes anonymous it was themes all right okay so you know four or five things drop out because yeah. people say the same sort of thing maybe yeah. in different ways and one of the things i was told was get out of the way of the business you are blocking the business <laughs> because you were coming in with these wacky ideas every you know and read something over the weekend right i've got a great new idea this is what we're going to do and then sort of two weeks later i'll say to the team well why hasn't that been done you know on the main business and they go well we're working on mm. exciting new project over here oh no 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 i'm bored with that i'm not doing that anymore mm. so i was told <laughs> by this external consultant get out of the way of the business you're blocking the business take your stupid ideas put them in a different company. And I actually did actually set up a separate company okay. to put my fantastic new ideas in. So it wasn't bothering the main yeah, business, but I couldn't see that. So I can see the value in somebody external coming into a business or, or not necessarily coming. And I, I don't go into the business. I sit with the business owner. Yeah, I sit with the business owner and that external view, however you execute it has so much value that, that, I think every business, whether it's me or whether it's somebody else, should have somebody external, professionally, helping them. And helping them as a business owner, because most of us, you know, a lot of us, however long we're doing it, it's probably still the only business we've run. You know, yeah. we've worked for people, we've worked in other companies, and we've seen different management styles and all that sort of thing. But in that. a lot of instances, it's the first or maybe the second business mm-hmm. we're running. Mm-hmm. So we're learning on the job. So actually mm-hmm. having somebody who's been there, done that, you know, got the scars – to advise you is is so valuable so right. valuable a couple of questions so you, you said right at the beginning you, you sit in between um being a coach and a mentor yeah so you know d- give me a bit more depth what's the difference between a coach and a mentor and what what gap do you feel that either of them either don't or they both yeah. miss 
I think the thing that the, the best way I explain a coach and a mentor is using a football analogy. <laughs> so, um, take a football manager. So Jurgen Klopp, for example. I was going to say Bielsa, but he's no longer with us, not at Leeds anyway. So Klopp will, or his team will coach the team to play better. So they'll teach them how to do certain skills better. So in business, that might be a sales coach or a presentation skills coach or a leadership coach. They're teaching you a specific skill yep. to get you from here to here from yep. a skill level. A mentor, and using a football analogy again, might be, um, we'll use a Leeds United example, Patrick Bamford, striker, might have Alan Shearer as a mentor. So Shearer won't necessarily be teaching him how to play better, how to score better goals, but but we'll be sitting with him and say, well, I had the same issues as you and this is how I played out, or I had the same opportunities as you and this is how I played out. So a mentor has been on that business journey, journey. and can say, look, you know, these are the sort of things that happened to me. You can ask me questions. I can tell you my experiences. Whereas a coach teaches you to do something better. Hmm. And I sit in the middle of that. So a little bit of it is coaching. Yeah. A lot of it is mentoring, but most of it is just listening and prodding and poking and and being, as the name suggests, a sounding board. Mm. Okay, fantastic. And and typically with any business that you work with, is it nine days, three months, twelve months, less or more? Yeah. So the the standard way I so the standard package I offer clients is it will be six sessions over a three month period. So there'll be a monthly face to face. Sure. meeting or or I've got, currently got a client who's not local so it's a zoom um so a monthly face-to-face slash zoom meeting and interspersed between that so every two weeks is a phone call yep. a catch-up phone call sure sure um so normally the first session will very much be i mean w- with most clients with all clients i'll do a um a deep dive first so that, you know we'll find out where we are what we're trying to do whether we're right for each other i might not be right for the client the client yep. might be right for me um, and then we'll start with, okay, what is it? We'll start with that question. Yeah. What does perfect look like? Oh, it will either be, what does perfect look like in a year? And we'll start working through that. Or it will start the other end, which will be, okay, what's your problem? Why have you come to me? Um, and then we'll work through it. And I love that because if you start with the problem, then we've got focus. Yep. Otherwise, if we just start with, yeah, we, we need to achieve this, but you don't understand the why. Yeah. Then sometimes... A lot of people can lose focus on why are we doing what we're doing yeah. midway through a project. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I've I've had, I mean, a couple of a couple of very sort of extreme examples. I had a client who came to me and said, I'm just, "I just hate my business. Just frustrated. I just bloody hate it." And what he had was was three separate businesses, and it, we sort of described it as like a big ball of spaghetti. Okay. And what we did with my help and, and he did we sort of laid out the three business strands of pieces of spaghetti and then said okay this is the strategy for this business this is the strategy for this business this is the strategy for this business so he went away and and you know his testimony for me was phil made me fall back in love with my business fantastic which is great awesome. well that was the aim whereas um and i had another client um who's a a, a woman who owned a group of children's nurseries and she was actually recommended to me by her husband who said, look, I think my wife needs some some help on the business. And the problem she had was very much she needed the helicopter view because in her mind, she was still running a children's nursery. Sure. What she was, in fact, was the MD of, uh, I think it was seven children's nurseries, you know, 150 staff, five million pound turnover. You know, she's a big, big business. So, so she needed to move her mindset. Yeah from thinking she was running a nursery to actually you're running a bloody big business here. An operation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and that that's very, very clearly needed somebody from the outside looking in and going, okay. I mean, a, a classic example, we were talking about acquiring more nurseries. And I said, well, why don't you acquire some more nurseries? She said, well, I couldn't because I wouldn't be able to get around them all on a regular basis. And I said, well, why do you need to get around them all? On? And she was telling me she, you know, she checked children had snotty noses and there was anti-back in the, kit in the toilets and and yeah the mats were all clean and i, I said to her, hang on a minute just let's rewind, <laughs> rewind rewind a little bit i said if you employed a managing director for this business and they told you they were doing that what would you what would you say yeah and it, you could almost audibly hear this penny drop yeah. and um 
yeah, that sort of moved her mindset. And actually, we had a meeting after we'd finished working together, and she very proudly showed me her her PA. Look, Phil, look, Phil, I've got a PA, you know. And she was dressing differently, and mm. and yeah, she was doing things like she was, you know, anytime they were recruiting, and obviously got big big staff. Anytime they're recruiting anybody, she'd be in there in their you know initial yeah, part of the process. Part of the process. And well, why are you doing that? You know, you're like some some part time nursery assistant. She goes, oh yeah, because I've got to you know I've got to see them, I've got to meet them. You know, I give everybody my mobile number. I, what? <laughs> you give every, you know anybody? Yep. Yeah, so they can all contact me. And it's like, God. And and this isn't pointing the finger at her. And this happens enormously. I see this a lot. That that. As your business grows, you don't change as the business owner. You're still doing stuff you were doing as a startup. You're not growing with the business. You're not. You're mentally, mentally not, growing. not growing with the business. And a lot of a lot of business owners will end up with um, stuff that they do that mm. they shouldn't be doing. Sure. Just by the e- either because they haven't palmed it off or delegated it or recruited somebody to do it, so it's just it's stuck with them, mm. or they like doing it and they you know. Mm. Like doing this, and I, and again with all of this stuff, I did all this myself. So, you know, we'd been the business been going 10, 11, 12 years, and I was still the one sending out invoices. Now, no disrespect to bookkeepers or accountants or anything like that. I thought, for God's sake, I shouldn't be doing that. So we got a bookkeeper in. Mm-hmm. She did better than I do. Yeah. She introduced more systems that made sense. She did the uh, credit chasing. The yeah, debt chasing. Of course. Um, and also it allowed me to do the stuff I should be doing. And, and I often talk about, are you doing the £10 an hour jobs, the £100 an hour jobs, or the £1,000 an hour jobs? Absolutely. And people go, well, I can't afford to recruit a PA or a VA or a junior exec or whatever it might be. Can't afford it. Mm-hmm. You go, well, yes, you can, because they'll be doing the £10, you know, nominally, the £10 an hour jobs, which allows you to do the hundred or thousand pound hour job. So you're actually bringing more money in and bringing more value to the business mm-hmm. by investing, not spending, investing on an additional member of staff mm-hmm. or additional capacity. Yeah. And and again, I did I did the same. And and I remember somebody advising me, and 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 it really takes the risk out of recruitment, um, saying to me, Well, actually, let's say you let's say you're recruiting somebody for uh, twenty four thousand pounds a year. You think, oh my God, I can't afford twenty four thousand pounds. That's that's huge. And he said, well, actually, your risk is two hundred two thousand pounds a month. Yeah, that's all it is. Exactly. Because after you know, I'm not I'm not proposing hiring and firing. I'm just saying, you've got usually you've got three month probationary period. Yeah. So your risk, and you, and it's usually usually it's a week's notice, mm. maximum month's notice. So your risk level is two thousand pounds. Now. Over three months, okay, it's six thousand pounds. At that point, if you're doing it right, you should realise, geez, how did I cope without this person before? Exactly. Yeah. So, and again, I did that, and everyone everyone knows, you know, when you take on your first member of staff, it's really scary. And every time you take on some more staff, it just goes as a cost, mm-hmm. and it's another figure that adds to the figure you have to get in revenue before you pay any, before you do anything else. Yeah. Yep. Um, but it expands, and, and I did this during my career and my business. Amazingly, every time we took on a new member of staff, our capacity went up and our revenue went up. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know where we got to. <laughs> like we're, yeah. we're at lots and lots of different places there. How interesting. So is there any kind of business that you won't work with? Um, I asked that question. Yeah. I asked that question from a point of view. We can't work with every kind of uh, business. Yeah, and, I think I think the the restrictions for me, arguably, would be size. Mm. So you know, my business, um, we got to maximum turnover of about two million quid. So I I think the step change of of a of a feel and a style of a business is about five million. Then you get into you know, different offices, bigger problems. You've got sure. teams, departments, all that sort of thing, which we didn't have. So I'd find it hard possibly to advise on that without justification. Um, so I think size is one of them. Um, obviously, geographically, I'd prefer to work with people, people in Leeds because then I can do face-to-face rather than Zoom, but it doesn't sure. matter. Sure. Um, I think sometimes 
I set a lower level of about half a million pound turnover and, and maybe six staff because lower than that, I think you need, you need to make your own errors and, and learn and grow. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, they want me saying, oh, don't do that. Mm. You've got to do it yourself. Yeah. You've got so to that's probably the parameters. And then I think you're not being all, all political and right on here, but, but, there are certain industries I might go, do you know what? I'd rather not work with you mm. for personal or, or political reasons. But, mm. you know, I wouldn't not work I don't know, with somebody in the coal industry because I'm against, you know, anything like that. But if somebody was, I don't know, let's think of something, something really extreme, an extreme right-wing organisation, <laughs> you know, don't want to work with you. Thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, thanks, yeah. but no thanks. Yeah. Or if somebody came, you know, somebody... Uh, somebody from Man United came along and said, could you work with me? <laughs> no, nope, sorry, mate, can't do that. <laughs> Not going to happen. Um, it's interesting that is, we, we've got the same feelings on a number of things. We can't work with every business for, for, for the similar reasons that you, you've touched on as well. The big thing is that we try to capture really earlier on is what's the motivation yeah. and and will they think outside the box? Yeah. And if they can't think outside the box, then there's no opportunity for us to really work because we're going to be hitting a, a brick wall every time we suggest something different that doesn't fit with their comfort zone. Yeah. So really early on, that's something that, you know, beyond the demographics is the psychographics. What's their, yeah. what's their aspirations? You know, do they just want to move forward incrementally? Yeah. And that's fine, but you don't need us. Yeah. And then just carry on doing what you're doing and, and then happy days. <laughs> you touched on a good point about certain industries. So you talked about William Hill and, and the whole, I suppose, gambling betting yep. industry. Yep. In, in, in the past, we've worked with Gentings, the yep. casino. Yep. And we did quite a lot quite a lot of work um, through an agency with them. But now I don't think I would take that work on. Okay. So anything wow. to do with gambling, okay. anything to do with alcohol, yep. anything. We, we, we got offered some work around e-cigarettes when they came into a big thing. Yeah. Um, we turned it down. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't sit right with where I am at the moment, Absolutely where we are. Fine, yeah. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, then the, the kind of industries just don't sit right with us. Yeah. And, and there's plenty of other work for us to do yeah um so we just we, we've turned them down yeah and that's fair that's absolutely fair enough yeah absolutely fair enough and and one of the things um i often talk about and it, it's not specific to what you're talking about but it's, but it's mm. it's similar is is niching Ooh. is you know really really drill down to a niche and now if you niche you end up turning business away yeah which particularly when you're in a startup phase is like yeah. oh shit, don't want to do that. but <laughs> yeah. if you want to be known for this niche, whatever that niche might be, mm-hmm. you have to do that. Um, so, but in, but so, in the, it, so just jumping straight yeah, in, sorry to interrupt yeah, sorry, yeah. midflow. Yeah. Are you, are you pro niches? You yeah, yeah absolutely. Thing? Absolutely. So, so our business, um, so if you, I always say you should niche at least three levels. Okay. Okay. So to take my business as a start. So the macro level is gambling. Sure. Okay. Uh, the niche within gambling is online gambling. Sure. And then the niche within online gambling, we were online bingo. We only did online bingo. Mm. So we didn't do online casino. We didn't do online sports book. We didn't do online lottery. Mm. Uh, we didn't do online poker. We did online bingo. So we, in theory, we're four niches down. Yeah. And when I talk about niching, the ideal situation to get to is to be on a short list of one. Okay. Okay. So let's say, I will use your, your business for example. Let's say... You said you wanted to niche in, I don't know, pick a pick an industry sector. Well, well, yeah, great example. So I want to niche in. Um, th- there's two niches I'm working yep. at the moment. One is manufacturing. Yep. The other is the legal industry. Okay. So you want to get to the point where somebody says, um, "We're illegal. We're illegal. We're lawyers. We need a promotional video, whatever it might be. Sure. Who do we go to? Sure. So you look at the market, yep. and you've got, you know, we do video, we do video, we do video. Yep. We specialize in legal video. Absolutely. Oh, well, we'll go with him. Yeah. Because you've created a short list of one. Yeah. Now, if I'm not in manufacturing and not in legal and I come to you. Yeah. Um, and I say, oh, I've got a big project and we're in education. farming. Education. Farming. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> big something. yeah. Farming education. <laughs> <laughs> and and here's a you know, we've got a budget of a hundred thousand pounds. That's pretty tough yeah. for you to to go. Thanks, but no thanks. Now you might do it, mm. and you might be you might do it absolutely fine. Mm. 
But what you might do is you might not put it on your showreel mm. and you might not market it. Mm. Conversely, it might open up a sector you didn't know. Who yeah, knew there was a far educa yeah, yeah, yeah. an education yeah. sector in farming? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, there are pros and cons to to yeah. it, and and you know we again on our you know and, and so much of what I talk to clients about we did in our business journey we stuck a toe in online poker very early on okay couldn't work it out gave up after about four months later on in our sect in our in our business journey because um, I'm a football fan I've I've always wanted to get into sports betting but we were quite late to the party so I never tried it but I tried a, a, a sort of different way in this was one of my shiny new ideas that the team got annoyed about uh, again lasted about six months and we, we, we jacked it in. But if you were an online bingo company and you were launching in the UK, you came straight to us. We had people coming to us before they were launching saying, Fantastic. we're launching next month. We want to book an ad campaign Fantastic. because you're the guys. How interesting. So if, we, if we'd if we have had um, mm. a website that had a section on online bingo, a section on online casino, you know, yeah. we were yeah. Yeah. that sort of thing. You, um, you were leaders in the market. You positioned yourself. We were frankly. the only, we were, by the end, we were the key player in the online bingo sector for various, various different reasons. So that's why I'm really hot on niching. Now, a lot of people are very happy being generalists, and that's absolutely fine. So, so let me just rewind that back yeah, to sure. what you're doing now. Do yeah. you niche in your coaching mentoring business? Um, I do. <laughs> this, is, this is very cobbler's shoes because I don't specifically niche. Okay which I should do. Okay. Now, um, having said that, I've had a number of clients from the online gaming space because okay. I'm known, I'm already yeah, known well in there. Known. Yeah. Um, and I've ummed and about niching in there. Um, I niche in a way from a business size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I niche, I try to niche geographically. Yeah. So leads in the area. Sure. sure. Um, the reason I ask is because I, I've had the same conundrum in my head for a number yeah. of years. So historically, we've worked in two areas of businesses. Yeah. One area is sales marketing, yep. and that kind of look, covers the whole spectrum. And for larger corporates, internal comms. Yep. And internal comms starts from HR to <coughs> recruiting, HR, induction, um, training, ongoing yep. uh, engagement, learning and development, L&D, you know, all of that yep. jazz. So... If you're a large corporate, you know, First Bus, uh, McDonald's, uh, PPG, uh, Jaguar, they all have that internal comms function. They understand it. And that's my go-to. Yeah. And whether you're Jaguar in, in car manufacturing industry, whether you're PPG in paint manufacturing, or whether you're first in, in buses, it's not the industry. It's the function. Yep. Is yeah, my so that's another niche, yeah. Yep. So you're, niche, you're sort of, you're niching that way and, and it, that way. Yeah. But I've never niched in industry. Yeah. I've only niched that way, which yeah. is just that um, kind of specific need internal comms. Yeah. <laughs> so last year we thought, well, let's try niching the other way. So this year, back end of last year, this year, we started now to look at different verticals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now I suppose I'm, I'm narrowing it down. So um, sales and marketing for legal firms, sales and marketing for manufacturing. Um, and even though we, we're still looking for corporates, um, if you get one or two a year, just because the sales cycle is so much longer, so much yeah, harder than, than happy days. But, you know, it's more the SME, medium-sized enterprises that we, we we kind of look look to do business with in the sales and marketing space. But just to say the sales and marketing, the argument that, or the perspective I kept hearing again and again, speak to everyone, yeah. speak to nobody. Yeah, speak to correct, nobody. correct. And so, so hence that's that's what I thought, well let's let's try it yeah and then if if we get traction happy days and... I think also it's easier theoretically it's easier to target an industry rather than a, rather than a function yeah so for example I mean I was always I'm pretty old school and 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 you know, I'm a big advocate of of industry exhibitions mm. and conferences and things like that so if you were getting into for example legal. Let's say there was a, a big legal conference sure. in Leeds or the NEC or Wembley or wherever it might be. You could go down there and, and you are targeting your audience. Yeah. Bang. Trying to do it by function. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure there are sales and marketing conferences and, and you know HR conferences and all sorts of things. I think it's a bit more complicated, mm -hmm. probably harder to do. Um, so a lot of it is not necessarily about product because you can do video for anybody. It doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's how you get that message out mm. that 
we're specialists Indeed. in legal. Indeed. And then as you do it and you get more and more examples. So we've done work with, you know, legal company one, legal company two, legal company three, then legal company four go, oh, these are the guys. Mm. Whereas looking at the showreel of somebody else who goes, well, you know. How's that going for me? We've done yeah. this, we've done this, you know. Yeah, yeah. And we all, yeah. and, and this is the thing, so many um, industries and so many sectors and so many services are the sort of things you can go, oh, I can do this for everybody. Mm. And you end up servicing nobody. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why I'm a big, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of niching because we did it. Yeah. But I can see the logic behind it as well. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I agree. It's an interesting, it's an, it's interesting. Um, and, and I've seen successes on both sides. I mean, we've had success the other way and, and now we're trying it this way. Um, if somebody knocked on our door that was outside of our niche, would we still service them? Yes, we would. If there's a fit. If yep. they've, you know, if the synergy is right, if they, um, if the problem they have is a solution we can fix, then absolutely, why sure. we wouldn't turn that business away? Because um, I think that's what's like you, you, you uh, mentioned that earlier on. A lot of people are scared about well, if you niche down, and some out of your niche knocks on your door, can you do business? Well, yeah. What's you can do business? With them? But what you also what you don't want to do, yeah. and and again, take a very extreme example. Yeah. You know, somebody comes and knocks on the door. And says, you know, we want you to do this project. Yeah. You go, right, okay, it's gonna take a week. Yeah. And then legal company knock on the door and go, We need something really urgent. Mm. You're the guys, you know, you're the man. Sure. We need it on Tuesday. And you go, I can't do it. Because I'm doing, cause it. doing this other thing. So yeah, that's a very extreme example. Of course. Um No, I think it's, it's a great it's, point. It's, and, it's, and, it's a niching's really it's a fascinating sector, it's a fascinating mm-hmm. subject, and there are pros and cons to follow. Yeah. And a lot of companies can't afford to niche initially. Yeah, um, yeah, because the goal is more maybe. Revenue. Need to, I need to get some, you know. I need to get turnover in, you know. Of course, of course. And <clears throat> what I often think about on the point that you just said is that you know, should you take some business on, and would it compromise maybe your core offering or, or where your niche is? Going back to where you started about, you know, what does success look like in one year's time? And then I break it down into um, um, quarters, and then months, and then weeks. And is everything I'm doing today going to contribute to my goal, my weekly goal, monthly goal, quarterly goal, and my annual goal? Yeah. And if it is, great, keep doing yep. it. And if it's not, don't do it. Then don't do it. It's very we simple. had uh, again this this ties in with exactly that, and it ties in with what I said earlier about getting external advisors in. We had a, a consultant came in fairly early on on our journey, maybe six, seven years in, and did some work with the team. And we ended, and he introduced me to a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's quite an old book now, but it goes, it, it, it focuses, as the, as the title suggests, it compares a selection of businesses who were both good. And then why did somebody become great? And, and sort of looks at all the companies that went great and see if there's any synergies or not synergies, any, any, anything um, consistent with all. Mm. And he ends up with this thing called a BHAG, Big Hairy Audacious Goal. So it's the whole, you know, shoot for the stars type thing. Sure, sure. And he produced this BHAG for us and it was on a flip chart and he laminated it and we stuck it on our meeting room wall. Okay. And our BHAG was to be the world's leading supplier of online bingo players. Okay. Okay. Now, bearing in mind anything that says the world's leading or the world's number one, that's like, that's a big, hairy, audacious goal anyway. That's how, yeah. Bearing in mind, we were in North Leeds over a sandwich shop at the time <laughs> with, I think, four staff. That was really audacious. But we put we had it on the meeting room wall till the day we sold because every time we were in there, we were talking about things just exactly like you say. Mm. Here's a great idea. What well, Does it contribute to that? Mm. Yes or no? It's quite black and white. Yeah, yeah. And if it's no, it might be a brilliant idea. Yeah. But it doesn't contribute to where we're trying to get to. Exactly. Um, and again, that helped us focus. Often, it was my idea that people were saying, "No, it doesn't contribute." <laughs> yeah, and and I've learned over the years, their ideas just park it, park yeah. it for six months, yeah. and revisit in six yeah. months. Don't throw it out of the window. Just park it. it might be it yeah. might be relevant in six months' time. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. So, do you have? Um, any resources to share that I can put in the links? Do you have yep. any takeaways that you can, you know, what are your three yep. takeaways for any kind of, whether you're starting in business or you've been running a business for the last 10 years or, or longer? Yeah. Any quick tips to share and any resources that we can give away? Yep. So um, my main the t- tip I always advise people is JFDI. 
Okay. Just do it. Do it. <laughs> um, often in business, you will, um, oh, we've just talked about it, we'll think of ideas and blah, 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 blah. Um, and, you know, research them, you know, do a SWOT analysis of them, all that sort of thing. But if your gut, and I always say follow your gut, if your gut mm. is saying, this feels like the right way to go, go for it. Because if you yep. do, yep. and it works, fantastic, happy days. It if it doesn't work, yeah. Well, I tried it, but I, I learned some lessons. If you don't do it, mm. all that happens is it's going to chew you up. Oh, we should have done that. We should have done that. We should have done that. So go for it. And, and you know, in business, you know, the vast majority of us, and this is not belittling anybody's business, the vast majority of us are not doing anything life and death. We're not doing brain surgery. If it fucks up, you know, what, what's, the worst, what's the worst? What's the really, really worst? I mean, obviously, don't do anything stupid, but yeah. what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, it's true. So that would be my key is always... Yeah, you know, do the work, and then what your gut tells you to do, go for it, yeah. and we'll we'll take it from there. In terms of sharing resources, um, we've talked about the FFS. Yeah. Um, I'll share you a link onto my website Please on do. that. Yeah. Um, I've also got um, um, a process I call the the Pitter Patter process, which is okay. a problem solving process. Pitter standing P I T A, pain in the ass. So, what's your biggest pain in the ass problem in your business today? Mm. I've got a very simple process that you'll get to a solution or at least an idea as how to solve that solution in five minutes. Sure. So we can add a link to that. And I have a regular weekly newsletter, so I'll add a link to that. And anybody who's watching this mm, can, 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 <laughs> can, can uh, subscribe and, and add themselves into that. Okay, fantastic. Okay, brilliant. Please share them resources. Obviously, um, share all your social handles as well. Yep. So any, anybody wants to get in touch with you directly and wants to just have a chat, I trust you do what, a free 15 minute, 30 minute? Happy to, happy to talk to anybody. Coffee? Happy. <laughs> I'll have a coffee with anybody. I'll have a chat with anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm not the right answer, I might be able to point you the right direction. Um, often it's, it's you know, I've had discovery sessions with people who, who haven't gone on to work with me, who've somebody sent me an email recently and said, oh, thanks, that was absolutely brilliant. You've given me loads and loads of ideas. Brilliant. Fine, well done. Great. Perfect. Happy days. And I love that. And it's the same consultative approach that we have. Um, quite often people are sometimes... Um, they resist the phone call or they're hesitant to make the phone call yeah. because they think that, well, if I commit and if I take advice, I'm obligated to move yeah. forwards. Yeah, no obligation. We always say there's no obligation. Speak to us, even if you don't work with us and you go with a different agency, a different video production company, or you do it yourself, happy days. Yeah. But hopefully we'll give you some value. We'll give you some clarity on what we think is best for what yeah. all your needs are. So um, I, th I think it's, I think, in 2023 going forward, it's the best approach because it's about building relationships. It's of not course. about trying to sell or we've got to get this business in. If, if the fit is right, it'll just yeah. happen. It'll just move on to that next stage. If it's not, they probably weren't your customer anyway. So just yeah. let them carry on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, that's that's flown by. It's Sorry, <laughs> much longer than we said. 58 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's flown by. But um, th that's great. Thank it's you. All right. That. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> I, I was conscious that we were actually talking a long time, but if, I mean, you know, chop, chop it up if you want. Or yeah, no, no, it's fine. I, um, 